Hey everyone. So I wanted to spend a little time today talking about some areas that everybody goes through at one one point in time or another, some more than others, and that is the concept of anxiety and phobias, something that is a part of life to a certain degree. Everybody has it. Uh, but when it starts intruding in a person's life and overpowering uh, a person in their life, that's when we have to uh, perhaps look at certain solutions that might be available in getting a person out of that rut. So I'd like to talk about some of those today as they are discussed in modern psychological studies and as well as they are addressed in, in particular as they're addressed from a spiritual vantage point, from a Torah vantage point. And so from a psychological perspective, anxiety and phobias are two sides of the same coin. When discussing anxiety symptoms, we frequently find uh, psychological changes that accompany emotional distress. And these are, these are symptoms like rapid heartbeat, a difficulty in breathing, a possible numbness or tingling in the person's fingers, sweaty palms, whatever it is. And these symptoms often resemble those of a heart attack, which can be something that person experiencing them will be further alarmed, right? Have more anxiety because of that. And so these same symptoms are seen with a person who has a certain phobic disorder with, with, this, with this difference. The difference in the person with a, a general anxiety and the one with a phobic disorder is uh, the person who's experiencing severe anxiety might have symptoms uh, almost anywhere. Uh, the phobic person, however, limits their environment that the symptoms are presenting. Uh, that, in other words, they'll, they'll limit the environment where the symptoms show themselves. So it'll be only in closed places, or it'll be uh, only around dogs, or only in elevators. So uh, one error that some people make. Uh, is one area, an error that the, the phobic person makes is that, uh, that these places or things are the ones that are blamed for the problem. Like you blame the dog or you blame the elevator uh, or whatever the case may be. Now, let's clarify a little bit the difference between legitimate nervousness and fear, which are, which are, again, these are human emotions, nervousness and fear is not something that we should think that there's something deeply wrong with us. There's legitimate nervousness and fear, uh, and then there's anxiety and phobias. Now, uh, the, the difference is based, is, is really premised on the idea of its rationality. Okay, so prior to beginning a new job, or meeting your potential in-laws for the first time, we might experience uh, a certain degree of nervousness. And, and we can identify the reasons that we are nervous and we proceed despite our nervousness. Okay, say, so why, why am I nervous at, my, at meeting my in-laws for the first time? Well, because I know that I'm going to be with these people for a long time and they're, they're, that they're going to be uh, looking at me now for the first time and first impressions matter and, and whatever the case may be. And we can, we can make a good case as to why we are nervous and we're still willing to proceed and to go forth with whatever it is that we're nervous about. Uh, if, if we're held up at gunpoint, Right, fear would be something that no doubt the person would experience. So, a legitimate fear uh, or a nervousness about a particular incident that is going on is not is not something that we have to avoid at all costs. And any sort of fear, any sort of nervousness, is just intolerable. Uh, since fear is usually an appropriate emotional response when a person feels helpless or inadequate in a threatening situation, this too is a legitimate emotional response to perceived actual danger. So if a person, again, is, is perceiving something as an actual danger and it legitimately is an actual danger or a reason to feel nervous that there's rationality associated with it, that is something that Okay, that's fine. That's 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 something that's normal. We may not enjoy going through it, but we typically are able to push through it and do what we have to do. And um, and our response 
is a legitimate response. It makes sense. Uh, it's when the nervousness and the fear become extreme and morbid to the point of preventing a person from normal interaction that the emotions are given the, their, their psychological labels. So when, again, experience these, experiencing these emotions occasionally to different stimuli uh, that make sense and it comes up every once in a while in a person's life, the, the, and the idea of being able to sort of continue on the path and push through it, the, this, is, this, is, this is okay, this is normal. Uh, when, again, when the nervousness or the fear become extreme and they become morbid to the point that they prevent a person from normal interaction, uh, that these emotions are given their psychological label. So there's a saying uh, that is attributed to Alfred Adler, a famous uh, psychologist, uh, or one, one of the primary voices in, in psychological theory uh, in the course of the 20th century. He says that man knows more than he understands. A man knows, a person knows, knows more than they understand. And this implies that although the sufferer, although the person, the individual, does not understand the dynamic of the disorder on a level of awareness, uh, that person knows what is being accomplished with the symptoms. Right? You, you, know, you, can, you can know that there's something up uh, and, what's, and what's going on without being able to perhaps pinpoint exactly where this is coming from and why it's coming up now and, and, uh, and, and the like. So what is the mental process that leads a person uh, to the anxiety reaction? What is it that uh, makes this the, the way in which a person is engaging in life? So to begin with, the individual, the person, conjures up the worst possible event or the worst possible scenario that could possibly be. And then that person uh, enacts in the situation in their mind as if, the, as if this terrifying event actually occurred. In other words, they process what, what's the worst possible scenario, what's the worst possible event, and then act, their body reacts to it as if that had actually taken place. They become paralyzed, they become nervous, whatever the case may be, but it's all, it's all reenacting, uh, it's all enacting an event uh, that you've taken the worst case scenario and then acting upon it as if that thing has actually taken place. And so the dy dynamic of the phobia is, all, is identical, the variation being that there's a specific setting that's used to trigger uh, as a trigger mechanism with the mechanism chosen in line with that person's lifestyle or whatever the, whatever the case may be, whatever the triggering factor is, but the result is the same, is that, whatever it, that if you're standing high up, you're already imagining that you've fallen from that great height. Whatever it is, the idea is the same, that you are uh, putting in your mind that the worst possible scenario uh, not only can happen, but is happening, and you're responding to it as if the, the worst is happening to you right now. So both anxiety-ridden person and the phobic sufferer, uh, they, they both suffer with their symptoms. They both uh, process it in a way as if they're, they're going through the worst possible uh, imagined scenario that could come out of this particular situation. So in, in Jewish thought, two of the greatest evils that can adversely affect a person's health and their happiness are anxieties and phobias, right? So these evils, and again, we're not saying evil in the sense of like uh, demonic or anything like that, but these evils are not cast down up upon a person in some mysterious or supernatural way. There's not because the demons have gotten to you or anything like that, that we, we explain that a person, a human being, is capable of both pleasant and unpleasant states of mind. Worry is a disease, so to speak, that prevents a person from enjoying the pleasures uh, of the present, uh, that... Uh, and the, the way that the way that worry functions sort of as a disease that that uh, prevents a person from enjoying the present is by filling them with uh, with foreboding ideas about the future. Uh, it, it doesn't allow you to live in the moment. It doesn't allow you to enjoy the blessings 
that you have because it's constantly filling your mind with uh, things about how the future are going to be. And, and you just know that the future is going to be like this. So worry destroys the finest in uh, mankind. Why? Because it, it undermines a person's natural gifts and abilities. It is a characteristic of worry that the more a person worries, the more that the more the mind will seek out more causes to worry. It's like a vicious cycle. If a person starts worrying about something, the mind will will delve into it and try to find even more causes to worry. And where causes don't exist, it will the mind will actually create them in order to sustain the habit. You got to be worrying about something, right? And so worry is is a is a sort of a a dreadful thing in the sense that you can have a you can have all the situation in your life being relatively wonderful, uh, but worry doesn't allow you to enjoy them. And so, in Jewish thought, the responsibility of these problems or the responsibility of these thoughts of these reactions uh, are on the individual, are on the individual's shoulders. And and uh, once a person has developed a life of acting with anxiety, one's creative powers will do what's necessary to maintain it, however destructive or self-defeating it might be. So we are the ones that sort of invite this, this worry and, and sort of perpetuate this, this uh, viewpoint of our current life, of what our future expectations are. A state of nervousness can be more disturbing to a person's own self than any physical ache or pain. Because nervousness is a weakness of the nerves uh, that renders a person raw and sensitive to the impacts of life. So nervousness might take the form of extreme impatience. Um, a person who has like an inner nervousness not only might be in impatient, but might be uh, irritable, might get angry easily, uh, might have fears and grief might have an inability to, to concentrate or to rest or to, to sleep at night. So a person who has this sort of perpetual nervousness has a lot of ways in which that can be manifest in the person's day-to-day -day living. So Jewish thought recognizes a person's responsibility in developing, in cultivating, and maintaining this style of living. The importance of this recognition that, in other words, that it's on me, that I'm the one who invites this reaction into my life. The idea of, of acknowledging that, the importance of recognizing that, is the, is the recognition of, uh, that, that since we brought it on oneself, uh, one can do what's necessary uh, despite real pressures also to, to halt the process as well. Since I'm the one who invited it, or since I'm the one who perpetuates it, consciously or unconsciously, but I'm the one who who allows this state of nervousness to exist in my life, I also can be the one to halt that process as well. So nervousness is not an inherited disease. God gave mankind the power to make and remake himself. He gave a person understanding where a person can control the circumstances in which she lives. A person has the power to make his or her life pleasant and happy, tranquil and serene. So the natural order of life, if you think about it, actually demands this. Life in its fundamental aspect is calm, is serene. Nature itself emanates tranquility and peace. So where does this restlessness of mankind come from? Nervousness is mankind's creation. He delves it himself, he develops it himself through an erroneous way of living or viewing the world. A person labors with every last ounce of his energy, devotes every last ounce of his energy uh, to meet the increasing demands and increasing costs of the time. And with it all, the worries, he, he worries and worries and worries, and he finds himself afflicted with all the forms of dread. He dreads each coming day with its new anxieties, its new burdens, its pressing tasks. He dreads the uncertainties of the next day, the next year, the next hour. 
His heart is filled with regret over the past and foreboding about the future. There is no fulfillment in life of this kind. It's hectic. It's unsatisfactory. It's meaningless. It's just a constant perpetual state of worry. So here we find an important link between the psychological and the Judaic. In the psychological understanding of these problems, individuals conjure up the worst set of circumstances that can occur, and they act as if they already have occurred. And so this disturbance of the natural tranquility of life is what Jewish thought uh, says leads people to dread the future. What then are the steps that a person can do to remedy this sort of self-defeating way of life? So a first step is to begin accepting the reality that one does have to shoulder a certain amount of responsibility in life and the, a sort of magical wish for someone to make it better is not going to bring results. In other words, we have to understand that I'm the one who can – I'm the one and I'm really the only one who can make any sort of change to my situation. I shouldn't be awaiting uh, someone else to come along who's going to give me all the money I need or uh, give me the position I'm looking for or find me a wife or find me that we, we shouldn't be looking on the outside just waiting for that day where everything's just going to sort of fall into place. We have to sort of change the way we look on the inside, to change the way we view things on the inside and and that is the starting point. So the shouldering of of this of this weight needs to be on us. We have to know that it's on us to make the, the changes internally, okay? And so it's in our power and it's our duty to avoid pessimism, a, a morbid point of view that only precludes happiness and, and also it deteriorates the mind. A pessimistic mind cannot think clearly. Okay? A mind that's filled with pessimism destroys its own ambition, and it will cause the individual to lose interest in all the vital things of life. In, in Jewish thought, worry uh, is, is, um, is at least, is, or is, or is, is on, on par with uh, a sin. Being worried, uh, overly worried, irrationally worried, living in a state of worry. It's not that it's being depressed and being uh, anxious and worried. The, it's not that it's a sin in and of itself. It's that it leads to all sorts of sins. Because if a person can't think clearly, and a person is always down in the dumps, and a person is not able to access their uh, creative abilities or their intellectual abilities or their emotional – everything is, is halted, is stifled, then a person is led down the path towards sin. So again, it's not that itself is a sin, but in some ways it's worse than any sin because it just perpetuates this, this state of existence that, is, that, that leads a person in a in direction that isn't, isn't good. So, so everything that undermines health uh, – in Jewish thought, anything that undermines a person's health is something that is is sort of sinful, or or at least uh, along those lines. So again, it's not it's not that these things worry, anxiety, depression, uh, and I don't mean that in the clinical sense. I mean just a state of depression that that a person that a person is affecting their emotional health and and oftentimes their physical health. Well, we're not allowed to hurt ourselves. Uh, in Jewish thought. And so we need to, uh, if we are hurting ourselves, whether that's physically, which oftentimes it is, I mean, we're not like beating ourselves up, but if we're, if we're not correcting an overbearing amount of constant anxiety, and that's certainly going to affect, uh, to affect our blood pressure, that's going to affect our, our heart rates, our, all sorts of different uh, physiological uh, uh, matters in our body. And so through worry, we destroy the work of God, and, and, and God created us. He got, wanted us to be healthy. He wanted us to be sound. He wanted us to be cheerful. He wanted us to serve him with joy. That's part of the reason that we're here. That's like, that, that's like the, the pinnacle of why we're here. And so when we're constantly worried about everything, 
uh, and sort of living a life of pessimism, living a life of anxiety, of worry, of nervousness. This is something that we have to galvanize within ourselves to say, you know what, I, I'm sick of living like that. I'm sick of, I'm sick of uh, having that be my worldview. And so we don't command the person and just say, well, don't worry, right? It doesn't work like that, right? right? We, we simply give a new point of view, a new attitude toward life, right? Torah thought, Torah thought is kind of like, like a therapy, right? All forms of therapy, if you think about it, are really just teaching processes, whereby the troubled individual is taught alternative options, right? It's, it's, there's, an, there's an alternate way of looking at this. There's an alternate way of living a less self-defeating, more productive life. And so again, it's not we don't just tell a person, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. We, uh, the idea of embracing a Torah mindset, the idea of embracing Torah values, a Torah worldview, a God worldview, a God-centered view, a God-centered life is something that is key in shifting the way that we view our life and our surroundings. It's necessary to first change our outlook in life. Well, one of the one of the play, one of the areas that that people oftentimes um, get this a little bit wrong, or maybe even a lot wrong, is they try to change their outside circumstances. So I'm anxious. I'm worried. I'm whatever. And they want to. They say the only way that I can fix this situation is by uprooting myself uh, physically and putting myself in a, in a different situation. If I get a new job, if I get a new spouse, if I get a new situation, whatever it is, then I'll be happy. Because they, they look at X, Y, or Z external thing and say, that is the reason that I'm not happy. That is the reason that I'm unfulfilled. That's the reason why I'm nervous. That's the source of my anxiety. And meanwhile, things aren't... It's not about how it is on the outside. It's not about what the situations are on the outside. Most of the time, it's the way that we're reacting to them on the inside. So it's necessary to first change our outlook on our life. We also have to simplify our mode of living. Okay? In, in Jewish thought, we see that, that a mere behavior change is not the answer. We have to combine it with a behavioral change, with a God-oriented outlook. A person has to return to a spiritually oriented mindset, a, a life that is permeated with the realization of God's presence, of thinking of life in, a, in, in spiritual terms, as far in, in purposeful terms, the loss of faith or a failure to apply uh, apply faith to you know as a, as a living it in all of the ways in, in all of the affairs that we have in life is is more contributing to prevalent nervousness the nervous condition of mankind than anything else mankind today humans people uh, have lost a has lost contact with their creator. Not, not in any real objective sense. We're all just as connected with God uh, in an objective sense as we ever were. But as far as having that awareness, being in touch with that, a lot of us today have lost a certain sense of that. And so when people fail uh, uh, in this area, when, when a person thinks that it's, that, it's, uh, that uh, when, 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 when a person fails, and a person fails himself, and uh, when 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 his when his powers fail him, and, and a person has has nowhere to turn for hope. Uh, if you if you're not looking at God as uh, with you, as a part of your journey, as uh, something or someone that you have a an engaging, interacting life with, then as soon as a person fails, they feel like they're, they're, they're drowning, that they have nothing and nowhere to turn. They find no inherent harmony between yourself and uh, the, the life in which you live. The, the one that knows God, the one that knows God, that, that knows God is at his right hand, that knows God is inside with him and has charged him with the mission, that person can't be moved. That person has a tranquil heart. That person has a prayerful mind. Uh, that person cannot know the nervousness, which is the result of baseless fears and anxieties and a sense of futility. So Jewish thought is not simply connecting God 
to the problem, implying that if a person makes that, that divine connection, all the problems are miraculously going to disappear. Instead, uh, Jewish thought maintains that having God at one's right hand reminds us that the divine presence is within us as well. And as a result of this, we have the inner strength to deal with our own problems in a calm and productive manner. We are all aware that there are life situations that negatively affect us, uh, of which we have virtually no control. There are always things that are going to affect us that are beyond our kin. Jewish thought, though, reminds us that we don't, we, we, we don't have to... It reminds we we do have to control, we do have control of the responses uh, and the reactions that we uh, give to these situations and circumstances. What shapes us in our life, in our life story, is not adversity, the things that that uh, we can't help that just kind of come up in our life. It's how we respond to adversity. Okay, and so when we trust in God, failure is impossible. Where we see life in a new light, our outlook changes. What we formerly considered a stumbling block is now a stepping stone. What that which we we formerly regarded as an obstacle now appears in its true meaning as an instructive experience in our life. It's not again. It's not the adversity that we face. It's how we react to it that shapes us most. So again. There's no magic cookbook, and this is not a magic cookbook approach that's designed to ensure that we're never again going to feel badly, we're never going to be nervous about anything again, we're never going to be anxious about something, but it's a reminder that there are always, there are ways that we can, that we have available to us to experience the divine within us and around us, and thereby assisting us in establishing a harmony, a tranquility that God intended for us. Peace of mind means having a perfect harmony between the various elements that constitute a person. Harmony between the forces within us, with the forces without us. Uh, there is an inner tranquility, an inner silence that's not disturbed by the agitation and the fermentation of life's uh, stern combats. So here we see a most important method for implementing the desired changes to a person's self-defeating way of life, to affect a state of optimism from pe pessimism. The, this change to shift from pessimism to optimism is done with an element of faith in the divine spark within us, that it's the core of long-lasting results, that we recognize that we are put here with a purpose, that God has infused us with life for a mission, and that we, and God is with us, to empower us to be able to accomplish it. The one without faith, the person who doesn't have faith, carries alone the entire burden of all the tasks and all the achievements. Whenever he finds himself at the threshold uh, 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 about a doubtful future, whenever that person's confronted with uh, threatening circumstances in their life, his soul sinks into depression and fear. The future appears dreary. The future appears hopeless. Pessimism makes a person unsociable. It chills a person's relation with their fellow person, with their fellow human. Optimism is significant. It's significant of, of one's faith and one's peace. Pessimism speaks of discontent and doubt. The pessimist, by definition, must ha not have a spiritual attitude. Uh, because how could a person have faith in God and be pessimistic at the same time. A God who enlivens you. A God who gave, uh, gives life to you. A God who gives you a purpose. A God who wants you to accomplish that purpose. A God who helps you along that person purpose. If you have that as your core, if you have that as the nucleus of your life, how can a person, how can a person be pessimistic? So a person being pessimistic is obviously an indicator that there is a necessity for that person to enhance their faith, the awareness of their own faith, their own mission in life, the, own, the, the idea that God wants them to succeed at their mission, that God helps them to succeed at, the, at their mission. So the, the, 
we have to think about this. We have to, we have to make this, uh, um, we have to be aware, we have to take time out of our life to make sure that we're in sync with these ideas. And, and I'd like to invite anyone to, uh, to take a time in their day and, and give, yourself, give yourself some time of silence. Uh, however long that is, is reasonable for you to do, but a, a time of silence, a silent state is a, is a healthy state. And to have habitual moments of silence every day will deepen a person's streams uh, of their connection in life. It'll bring a person fuller joys. Uh, in the state of silence where you can reflect calmly on one thing or another, uh, the, the, deeper, uh, the deeper qualities of your existence, the deeper purpose of your existence, time to, to think for yourself, to assess things, to, to process and just, and just be. So in a state of silence, we, we might learn to change our attitude towards our various tasks so that they bring pleasure to us uh, instead of tedium. And we can rethink the way in which we think about certain things in our life. A state of silence is not only a place of refuge for those who seek to escape from the storms of life, but it's also a place that a person might seek uh, for guidance and and find it um, by allowing themselves to sort of process their life in a different way. One of the things that I notice in people is that they never give themselves the, the chance, the opportunity for silence. They're just running from one thing to the next. Uh, they, al they always have to be entertained. They always have to have something going on in front of them. They always have to be fidgeting with something, it, especially with smartphones and whatnot in people's lives. So you go from work, you go home, uh, you you'll deal with what you got to deal with. You put the TV on, you're on your phone, you're on it. And then until you go to bed, your mind is, and some people in bed with the, with the phone. So like the mind is constantly always engaged in external things. Never has the opportunity uh, and, the, and the benefit of silence. Never has the opportunity to sort of think about things, think about life, think about how we are reacting to things in our life. And so I would invite anyone uh, who, who wants to perhaps help an area of anxiety in their life to give yourself the gift of silence. Certainly the nucleus of it all is recognizing that we have a God in the world and that there's a God who gave us a specific mission in the world and God also gives us the power to achieve that specific mission in the world. And the more we reflect on that and give ourselves the opportunity of silence to reflect on that and think about the ways that we interact and engage and react to the situations in our life that cause us stress and tension and anxieties, it will, it will slowly shift the way in which we're able to look at things. And so this, this state of silence that, that we're talking about is almost a, a form of meditative state. It's not meditation the way that we typically, stereotypically uh, think about it, where a person's sort of uh, in a lotus position and inhaling through one nostril and exhaling through the next nostril and, and uh, doing all sorts of mantras and whatnot. But it, the state of silence is sort of a meditative state where, where many experiences can be felt. And the Jewish mystics have used this state of silence as a means of achieving a state of dvekos, a state of cleaving with God. A modern, modern psychotherapy uses this silent and hypnotic state to, to use visual imagery uh, with a patient, maybe, who, who can picture their ideal goal uh, that the individual wants to achieve. And going through that process is extraordinarily helpful uh, in a person dealing with their own uh, anxieties. And silent reflection, uh, profound meditation, uh, in this way alone, brings the human soul in touch with the infinite. It allows us to reconnect with our life, our life's purpose, in a whole different way. In the deep of life, there is a stillness, something majestic and divine. In the deep of life, there is only unity and harmony and love. Below the surface, all is clear, all is revealed. There we behold the mighty power of whom all reality springs. It's in this state of silence when we can sort of take a step, take a step back from the, the craziness that life sometimes has to offer where we can access this degree of tranquility.
this degree of uh, against the anxieties. Uh, again, the idea of the anxieties is not fighting off something external. It's learning a new way of looking at things internally, a uh, resp new way of, of responding to things internally. And so this is, this is sort of the Torah's approach to these particular things. And there's cert certain ideas and questions I'm, I might uh, you know, invite you to answer for yourself. Uh, these are methods that if I was speaking with somebody that I would uh, use in order to discuss with them uh, various aspects about their life that might be helpful in, in taming some of their anxieties. And some of the questions that, um, that, that I would approach, again, when a person is in a relaxed state of mind, uh, is, is, is number, number one, I would ask them like this. And I'll ask you, and you can you can think to yourself, and and hopefully uh, use this, uh, use these techniques in your own life. Um, so both you and I can agree that you weren't born with this anxiety, this phobia, this fear, this nervousness. And so the first question is, how is how is all this affecting you? Having this, right? Having, having the, having these, uh, having this anxiety, having this, how is it affecting you in your life? Right? Think about that. That's that's an important question to be able to identify. Second question um, that uh, I'd like to ask or invite you to think about is: What would you be doing, or what would you be able to do if you didn't have these symptoms? It's important. And sometimes just by identifying that, by the way, sometimes just by identifying in your own life uh, what you could be doing or what you would be doing if those symptoms weren't present can give us actually some insight into where these symptoms are coming from and, and why they're concentrated and why they're triggered in this particular area, right? If, if there's something, if there's something uh, that you say, if I didn't have X, Y, or Z symptom, uh, I would be doing this. Well, perhaps those symptoms are coming up in order to sort of guard you against this area. And we may have to talk about what the particular area is, why why it is that these uh, that these uh, symptoms come up when talking about uh, your work or your marriage or your uh, whatever situation you you find yourself in. Uh, another question that uh, I, I might pose, or invite anyone to to think about is what place does spirituality, does your Judaism, does Torah, does God um, have in your in your problems resolution? Where do you see spirituality uh, in your in the in the resolution of your particular problem? And the fourth question that I might pose um, and invite anyone to think about is: Do you see any solution to your anxiety, to your phobia? And that, that's something that's important to think about because if the answer is yes, which it should be, uh, then a person has to know that uh, there's hope and there is hope. The, a person should always know that there's hope. Um, but if a person can recognize that for themselves, that's already a very good step. And then it's just a matter of, okay, well, how do we get there? And so it's, it's definitely something, uh, this is something further to, to speak about. Uh, the core of all of this in our life, though, is is it reaffirming this godly connection that we have? Again, if God created me, and God continues to enliven me, and God created me for a specific purpose, and God wants me to succeed on my purpose and helps me on my purpose, why should I be anxious? Why should I be worried? Again, every once in a while, it's a normal thing. But the core of of long-standing anxieties that are stopping a person from doing what they want to do, we have to we have to reassess where a person is viewing their life in context with with God and spirituality. And a person uh, a person who is struggling in this area, there's one verse that that I think might be helpful uh, to an individual and something perhaps to keep on the back burner for when a person is feeling times of of, of anxiety. I'm, I'm not usually one for thinking of one verse or, or whatnot, but you know this 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 verse is something. Um, it provides a good imagery, 
and imagery is an important thing. And so I'll end off with this. That Psalm 121, verse 4, it says, Behold, the guardian of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. Whatever, wherever a person's at in their life, whatever a person's past is, whatever a person's present situation is, whatever a person is, is looking to in the future, whether pessimistically or optimistically, we always have to know that God stands at our right side. God neither slumbers nor sleeps. God is always with us. God is not going to let us down. God wants us to succeed in everything that we do. And with that, again, we still have to try. We still have to put the effort. We still have to do everything that we got to do. But only we can pursue what we need to do uh, in, in an effective way by knowing that God is with us in everything that we do. So I hope I hope this was uh, somewhat helpful to, to people in their own uh, struggles with anxiety, their own thoughts of anxieties uh, in, in both painting where anxieties and phobias come from and the core uh, method and how to deal with it. Again, there everyone's situation is different and everyone's the, the, uh, the intensity uh, for everyone is different. The causes are different and the way that a person reacts are different. So I'm not saying that this is a one size fits all type of solution, but the core for anyone who suffers in this area is reassessing and re-strengthening their connection with God, that to bring that awareness more to the forefront in their daily life. Have a wonderful day, and I look forward to speaking to all of you soon. Take care. How did Noah protect himself from the tumultuous flood? By coming into the ark. In Hebrew, the word teva means both ark and word. And by you and I delving into the words of Torah, we too are saved and protected from the tumultuous and catastrophic events that happen throughout our lives. The ARC online learning program is your opportunity, no matter what your religious background is, to delve into Torah in a thorough and clear way with a rabbi. Now, you don't have a lot of time. You're dealing with work. You're dealing with the kids. You're dealing with all sorts of stuff. That's why we've condensed every day's lesson into 15 minutes. Plus, you'll have access to all the back archives and access to the rabbi. So anytime you can learn at your own pace and whatever time you choose. I hope that you'll sign up for the ARC today. If you have any questions about it, just comment below. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing all of you on board the ARC today.